Welcome into this week's Degrees of Science. You know, we talk a lot about different things you can do to, that impacts your heart health, but have you ever thought about how your sleep impacts your heart health? Well, today we're talking with Dr. Julio Fernandez Mendoza. He's a professor of psychiatry and behavioral health at Penn State's Medicine or College of Medicine. So, Dr. F uh, Fernandez Mendoza, I guess, first off, how much sleep should people be getting? Great question. So, we do have expert consensus saying that Adults, specifically who have the best health overall, are those who report sleeping about seven to eight hours of sleep. Now, all of us agree, or most of the field agree then, that getting less than six hours of sleep if you're an adult, then that is associated with uh, health problems, including heart health problems. And of course, this changes with age. So in, a, in older adulthood, maybe getting six to seven hours it would be recommended like when you're 80 years old, or when you are younger, right? Like in uh, in youth, for, including teens, at least nine hours of sleep is the recommended amount of sleep. So say people are getting enough sleep, but they're not getting good sleep. How? What would be some signs if they were just not feeling well, even though they think they're getting enough sleep? Excellent. Yeah, no, that's a great question because sometimes we assume, right, that um, if you're not, if you're getting sufficient amount of sleep, you should be good to go. And no, the re the the reality is that many people may get actually the recommended amount of sleep, but they have poor sleep. They have disturbed sleep, and the source of that disturbed sleep could be multiple. Some people have difficulty falling asleep, difficulty staying asleep, difficulty resuming sleep early in the morning hours. Some people snore. Some people have sleep behaviors, movement while asleep, or either they grind their teeth. So all these can be reasons why people may have disturbed sleep despite sufficient amount of sleep. And most people know it because they don't feel refreshed upon awakening. They don't feel restored uh, with the sleep. So we're talking heart health connected to this. What, what kind of issues can getting poor sleep or inefficient amount of sleep, what kind of impacts can that have on a person's heart health? So a lot of data has shown that insufficient sleep is associated with or is a risk factor for for heart problems and also poor sleep particularly when when combined with insufficient sleep as you were very wisely asking me before that is the group that has the greatest risk of developing heart problems and by the way, the first sign of that connection typically, and this is something that has been replicated across the studies, is high blood pressure. That seems to me be the first sign um, of people being at risk of later on also developing heart problems because of exposure to poor and insufficient sleep. Now, the connection between the two, we believe it's because when one has poor insufficient sleep, you typically have elevated stress hormone levels and elevated inflammation, oxidative stress, and multiple other biological mechanisms that link lack of sleep with uh, heart problems. What kind of advice would you give to someone uh, to maybe help them sleep better and help this potential heart health issue? So first of all, calm down. Let's not worry, because worrying about the consequences of lack of sleep can lead you to actually not sleeping, right? And I know that a portion of the population, we need to be sensitive with them that may be already worrying, and we need to tell them, not everyone with, for example, insomnia is at risk of heart problems, and consulting with a clinical provider would be the best way to answer, am I in that group or not? That's number one. But if we want to give people in the public general advice, I would say, of course, good sleep hygiene, right? Lifestyle habits. However, I always remind people this is, these habits are just simply good for everyone. There are actually behavioral interventions that are very effective in improving a sleep. And um, they are very rule driven. The six rules to get good sleep. One, get up every day at the same time, no matter what use your bed only for a sleep. Three, do not lay awake in bed. Get out of bed and do go into another room, do something enjoyable or relaxing if you cannot sleep and go back to bed whenever you feel sleepy. Four, do not compensate for a sleep loss. Get going with your day. Don't cancel things, don't try to sleep in or nap. Fifth, go to bed only when you feel sleepy. Don't go to bed because you have to, only because you feel sleepy, even if that means falling, going to bed close to when you're falling asleep. And number six, match your time in bed 
to the amount of sleep that you're currently getting, even, even if you have poor sleep. So go to bed, anchor with your rising time, and then each week expand or increase your time in bed by roughly 15 minutes. I think I broke a few of those rules, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> so, and this personally, I'm, I'm bad about this. So the, the taking a nap, so you think, oh, I need a little more rest. Does that help or kind of hurt the situation taking a nap? Absolutely, great question. Notice what I said, right? If you have a, a sleep problem, if you want to improve it, do not nap, do not try to doze and so forth. But it, that doesn't mean that napping as a healthy sleep behavior is bad for you. So if you are a good sleeper, Let's go back to your first question. If you feel you wake up refreshed, you're getting about seven hours of sleep. And then in the middle of the day, because your life circumstances permit, you're able to get your 30 minute power nap, you're totally fine. It's totally healthy. What matters is when naps or dosing during the day are a sign of con needing to compensate for lack of sleep. Well, that's, that's very interesting for sure. So if somebody maybe starts noticing they're, they're not sleeping well or having issues, when does it get to a level where you need to go to a doctor about this? We actually, you know, for, for difficulties of sleeping, for example, we have a rule of thumb, which is if you're experiencing difficulty falling or staying asleep at least three nights a week for at least three months, go consult with someone. When it's less than three months, it's typically an acute, a transient, a period, you may consult with someone and get care, but in many people, it may actually remit by itself. Now, during that transient period, the six rules that I mentioned can be highly effective in preventing developing a full-blown problem. Now, there are other signs and symptoms of sleep problems that may not require to happen as frequent or for that long. And in that case would be like if someone has observed you that you have breathing pauses while asleep, you need to talk to your uh, to, your, to a doctor and, and get consultation. Or if, for example, you move, uh, you act out your dreams while asleep, or you have nightmares, very vivid, distressing nightmares, do consult to clinicians. More, most people don't talk about them, but nightmares are treatable also nowadays with non-drug-based treatments, by the way. Speaking, speaking of treatments, uh, what, what kind of treatments are there that can help people to sleep better at night? So obviously, I think everyone is familiar with medications, right? There is hypnotic medications, uh, sleep medications, as people call them, sedatives that are highly used and widely used uh, for multiple reasons, not just insomnia, actually. So most people are familiar with those. I am not going to say that they don't work. Actually, they do work and probably they are needed in some cases. However, what most people don't know is that, for, for example, insomnia in adults, the first line guideline recommended treatment is cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, CBTI we call it. Now, it is proven that it's effective, it works. The problem is that it's not highly disseminated. There is not many of us in the country or even around the world that are experts in providing that specific treatment. And then there are many other behavioral treatments for sleep disorders, such as disorders of the timing of sleep that require a lot of behavior change, plus light therapy, or I just mentioned nightmares that are also treated with uh, behavioral treatments or non-drug-based treatments. But then there is other, medi uh, other uh, disorders that do require medications or surgeries or devices. Most people are familiar with CPAP, right? The PAP therapy uh, for a sleep apnea. But nowadays, sleep apnea can be treated also with medications. Medication was just approved. In, uh, it's a GLP-1 medication for a, sleep, for a sleep apnea, actually, that allows you to lose weight and improve your sleep apnea. That has been groundbreaking and it confirms some models about uh, the etiology of, of a sleep apnea. So there is a lot nowadays in the sleep medicine field and behavioral sleep medicine field that people can benefit from. Uh, what we need is better access to all these uh, interventions. Well, Dr. Uh, Fernandez Mendoza, I'd say very interesting stuff, and uh, I'm going to have to make some adjustments on, on my end as well. But thank you for taking <laughs> the time to talk with us. Absolutely. It was a pleasure.